Then we get started. So our today's guest lecture is Professor um, Paul Tibus, and um, we are very happy to have her. Um, by the time we invited her, she actually was an emerging PI, and so because we, we one thought of inviting her was also that we not only have you know old white man as uh, speaking, but we also you know can give emerging talent. Oh, we can actually put it from us. Um, give emerging talent um, a chance to to speak at length. Um, but apparently, you know, we, we just we picked too well. And in the meantime, um, Professor ba uh, pa Patrick Cruz became actually a full professor. So by the time um, we have invited her, um, that wasn't the case. And yeah, con congratulations on that. <laughs> that was uh, pretty cool to see. So her research, her theory research, focused on X-ray and quantum optics. So in simple terms, um, what she looks at is um, actually quantum effects and excitations of the nucleus. So usually you look at you know, orbital excitation, but that's kind of very, um, in a way it has been at least um, um, ex um, exotic. And um, her pure work uh, so it, um, focus on coherently controlling X-ray um, photons, and that covers um, nuclear clocks um, with uh, this core coupling of atomic and nuclear um, degrees of freedom, or also some uh, collision physics is nuclear. But you know, she will tell you that more detail as uh, well. And um, yeah, let me just add a, a small other uh, note because um, she's now an X-ray uh, scientist in, in Würzburg, and actually there, Professor Patrick was a pretty pretty good company, as you might know. The, the first Nobel Prize in physics was awarded um, on on someone doing X-ray research in in Würzburg as well. Uh, you might know him, um, Konrad Röntgen. So you might know him, and then some in some languages is X-ray radiation are also named after, after Röntgen. Uh, but she's not quite there yet, but still she got some very notable uh, prize. So um, they had a Spooner Prize in 2019. And um, yeah, due, due to the pandemic situation, we sadly don't, don't, have, to ha don't have her here um, with us now, but she graciously agreed to give us a lecture um, in a hybrid format, and it's called Quantum Dynamics of Atomic Nuclei from Tame X-rays to Measuring Time. And um, yeah, take it away. Um, I'm happy. I'm happy to hear you lecture. Thank you, Tima, for the kind introduction. I hope you can see me and you can hear me and also see my slides. Yes. So, good evening from my side. Um, I was very happy when I received the invitation. At that time, Timo and I were colleagues on the same corridor in Erlangen. Um, as you've heard from him, I moved on the 1st of April to Würzburg, and I was still very eager to come and meet a couple of kick-ass students this evening, but unfortunately, um, I got on Tuesday a positive test, and today I should still not meet people, although, thanks God, in principle, I'm doing just fine. Okay, yes, so today, Unfortunately, hybrid, so online, my talk will be on quantum dynamics of atomic nuclei from taming X-rays to measuring time. Um, I guess the easiest way to start is in, on a historical perspective. Namely, you know, quantum dynamics means that you are able to drive or influence the dynamics of quantum systems, of systems which have discrete states. And one of the First examples here is that 62 years ago, Ted Maiman was successful in building the first Ruby laser, the first laser by itself. And lasers, if you think of them, they are using atomic transitions, typically of valence electrons, to generate very intense light, right? So basically out of transitions of valence electrons, we can uh, get this very strong optical, typically or infrared light. And this light we then can use to control 
other quantum systems, which typically are first again atoms, but then also molecules and other systems. And overall, this invention of the laser basically has revolutionized first atomic physics, because this is where it came from, right? But then also many areas of technology, of metrology, of whatnot. So it's very difficult to understand what society and, and physics would be today if there would have, wouldn't have been a laser invented back in the 1960s. Now, um, you're just saying that, yeah, okay, you know, atoms and lasers, they just, you know, have this mutual control of each other. What's so interesting in just exciting atoms? Well, in principle, yes, this has been done a long, long time ago, already back in the 19th century. Bunsen and Kirchhoff in Heidelberg were doing kind of incoherent excitation by simply burning, right, some, some substances. But in comparison to what we do today, at that time, it was about incoherent excitation and simply passive observation of decay. Whereas today, we can really, with lasers, obtain full control of single atoms, of single ions, of single quantum systems. And we can use that for true full control of quantum dynamics uh, with implications towards quantum information or towards quantum computing, towards many, many fields, in principle, relying on lasers, on traps, on cavities, right? So to a certain extent, you might say the key word here is control, right? We have far more control now than we had at the beginning. And this was given to us by the laser. Now, nevertheless, today, it's not gonna be about that, right? So if we are looking on the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, it's more about visible light and infrared the laser, right? And I would like to focus now um, here towards the left-hand side, towards higher frequencies, right? Shorter wavelengths, higher frequencies, more energies, more energy. So X-rays and vacuum ultraviolet. So this is the region that I'm interested in. And now the resonant systems that can either generate light or which can be controlled by light of their frequency are no longer valence electrons in atoms, but more, I'm gonna to talk today about atomic nuclei because also atomic nuclei have transitions and these transitions can be driven for instance by X-ray light and in turns, the nuclei can be used to control X-ray light. So maybe here we'll also have some revolutionary ideas coming up or being uh, established experimentally, which would then address a different frequency regime and also different resonance systems. So this is the idea for my talk today. As Timo has mentioned, right, this is kind of a rather emerging field. It's a bit more exotic than what you've heard so far, uh, but it's still incredibly interesting. And I hope you'll stay with me for my talk in discussing, for instance, why um, X-rays are special and why this is so cool. Uh, one of the, incentives for going now towards x-rays is that in the past um, 12, 13 years, we have seen the uh, commissioning and the operation of the first x-ray lasers. For instance, if you look at your picture on the left, this is a huge machine um, called the Linear, Linear Coherent Light Source at Stanford in the US. And this was the first x-ray free electron laser. Um, by now, there's also an operation in Japan and also in Hamburg, here in Germany, we have the European XFL, which is, um, he had still written under construction, but actually by now they have seen light already a couple of, of um, years back, and they are just uh, slowly going through the specs and achieving the full capability that was planned. Or for instance, here, the extreme light infrastructure, nuclear pillar in Bucharest, uh, which is by the way, my hometown, this will be a source for coherent gamma rays, right? So we see that there are sources now which go higher and higher uh, in frequency. So maybe it's a timely idea to think about how uh, one can involve resonance systems with these sources. Um, X-rays in particular, if we're thinking of X-ray free electron lasers, um, they are very special because of, from my perspective, two main reasons. One of them is that um, they can penetrate deeper through material. And this is basically what made them famous, right? If we are thinking of uh, uh, Röntgen, which indeed discovered X-rays uh, at the University of Würzburg. 
um, then the fact that made them famous was that at that time, right, you could just make these photographs of bones um, because they penetrate so well through tissue. And that's very nice, right? So it means you can send X-ray photons through the wall and you also see them on the other side. Then uh, the other thing which is very interesting is that they are not plagued by the diffraction limit, right? Typically, if we try to focus light, then we can only focus up to more or less the wavelength of light, which actually for visible light is already quite annoying, which means that we are kind of limited at 800 nanometers. But now if we go for X-rays and we have a wavelength of one angstrom, that's already the size of an atom. So thinking in terms of focusing, right, whenever you have an optical focus and you are shining this on some atom matrix, on some solid state material, you always see many atoms at a time. Whereas with an X-ray, potentially with very good focus, you would be able to see one atom at a time. Now we are not yet there. I think the, the um, record of X-ray focusing at the moment is at seven nanometers. So not at one angstrom, but at 70 angstrom. Uh, but still potentially, right, there is no annoying limitation because of diffraction for, for X-ray light. So this means that they could be the ultimate miniaturization for photonic circuits, so circuits which work with photons, not with electrons, um, or they could give us uh, sensing with unprecedented spatial resolution. And the question that I want to ask today basically is whether we can use X-ray transitions to control X-ray photons, and you'll see that to a certain extent and under certain conditions, the answer is yes. Okay, now um, if we are turning the tables and thinking in terms of mutual control, whether nuclei are kind of can be controlled by light and whether we have any incentives about that, uh, we do have some incentives about that. Um, I will name today two and one of them I'll discuss in more details. For instance, one of them is that um, they are nuclear excited states which live very long. In nuclear physics, they are called isomers, nuclear isomers. So imagine the isomer, this is basically a, it's a nucleus uh, which is not in its ground state. It's somewhere in an excited level. And for some reason, this excited level lives long. I have here for you as an example, the partial level scheme of a nucleus called molybdenum 93. So it has 93 nucleons. It has out of them 42 are protons and the other ones are neutrons. Um, and molybdenum has uh, at 2.4 mega electron volt um, an excited state which lives for six hours, 6.8, so let's say seven. Um, all the levels above and below live much shorter, live nanoseconds, right? So that's quite a difference. And it turns out that if you're looking at nuclear models and you're assigning spins for the levels around, um, then um, it turns out that somehow in the leveling, right, typically the, the steps of spin are always two, but instead of having 13 half plus, 17 half plus, 21 plus, the order of the last two has been flipped. So suddenly there is quite a change in spin between this isomer state and the level below. And that's why that decay is very much strangled because of this large difference in spin. Uh, and here we go with our seven hours. And now, if you would be able, right, to uh, the on-demand charge and recharge this isomer, right, so populate it and deplete it, then you could use it as a kind of nuclear storage, energy storage, right, a kind of battery if you want. Although I think battery for battery, you need to have a plus and a minus, which here you don't have, but it could still store energy there. Um, and here in the case of the molybdenum. There's a lot of speculation on whether it's possible, for instance, to go from the up from this isomeric state to a state above the so-called triggering or, or gateway level. And this state decays also to the ground state quite pretty quickly with a nice branching ratio. So most of what you pump up here goes directly to the ground state within four nanoseconds. So you escape the seven hours, end up in four nanoseconds where you want to be. And just to give you an idea, right? If we are calculating the energy to mass ratio of some isomer material, right? So a piece of molybdenum where each nucleus would be in the isomeric state, then we see that we get 660,000 kilowatt hour per kilogram, which is huge compared to a lithium battery, which is 0.7, right? So just putting things into perspective, 
You are in a lecture hall now, I'm not, right? But uh, it's kind of the ratio between the lecture hall size and the Earth's diameter, right? So you can really store a lot of energy on very small mass. And this would be very cool. Um, and as you see, for instance, here, the upper level that you want to reach and uh, produce this kind of depletion is just 5 kV above, and this 5 kV is actually an X-ray. So you just need X-rays to pump in there to release, so to say, everything which is in the isomeric state, right? So this is kind of an incentive which works with nuclei and doesn't work with atoms, electrons, or something else at the moment. Another incentive is to think of a frequency standard. And as I'll come back to this later, uh, in more detail, right, we define our time right now and we measure our time with uh, somehow in relation to an electronic transition of the valence electron of cesium-133, the 6s electron. And I will show you that um, we'd like to use, instead of this atomic transition, a nuclear transition instead to build a nuclear clock, which would be kind of really cool because it would be uh, more precise clock, it would uh, be well isolated from the environment, and we hope also that it will allow us to answer a few other interesting questions, right? So as you see here, I basically go into directions now. First, I try to tell you that x-rays are nice, and maybe we can use nuclei to control x-rays, or I can tell you that we can use light to control specific nuclear transitions that we would find very interesting to work on. Now, for today's talk, actually, I had to... Uh, cut a little bit the story. So I have decided for the first two points, taming X-rays as the part of controlling X-rays with nuclei and the nuclear clock as from the part, we use light to control a nuclear transition and we see what we can get out of that. So this is the outline, two parts, taming X-rays and measuring time in a better and new fashion, which involves the one nucleus which can allow us to do this which is called thorium. And because it's called thorium, uh, I had to make the connection to Thor, the Norse god, and uh, we'll come to more details there later. Okay, so um, as for the first part, <clears throat> I think just to give you a flavor of the vision, the vision would be to use these nuclear transitions to build kind of photonic devices. These photonic devices are like components that can manipulate light. And our light here would be X-ray radiation, right? Not light as an optical light, which would be kind of trivial as Timo pointed out. With optical things have been, you know, things have been done, right? Many, many nice things have been achieved already. With X-rays, this is still to be done. Okay, and these photonic devices would allow us to have incredible X-ray control with unprecedented spatial and energy resolution. So the idea would be to, you know, you have here somewhere your photonic device, which has probably the nuclei that allow you to use these resonant transitions to control. Um, then you pump the light in, either from a X-ray free electron laser, maybe from a synchrotron. Actually, the few results from the experiment that I will show you are from a synchrotron source. Um, or you could also have tabletop plasma-based sources, which have the advantage they are not very large and you can have them in your lab, as, you know, as opposed to a synchrotron, which you cannot have in your lab because it's too large. And then you send this light through the photonic device. And this photonic device allows you then to filter the energy of the X-rays to control the propagation. Probably most of the pulse will be filtered out and you will be kept with just few X-ray photons, which can be very well controlled, which can be stopped, released, uh, switched to switch directions, or their face can be manipulated. So this is the idea of control, right, of X-ray photons. And these kind of cleverly tamed X-rays, they could be then used, for instance, for quantum technologies, for instance, for quantum imaging, right? Because we anyway use X-rays for imaging, but typically we come with a lot of X-rays, very strong, they destroy everything. And now maybe we could come for just few X-rays, which do not have so much destructive power that afterwards you can, for instance, keep your protein or whatever you're investigating still intact and see it also later in its dynamics, right? Or you could use these X-rays for, uh, information as information carriers, like for X-ray qubits, 
you could use these photonic devices to have secondary X-ray sources with specific properties, for instance, for, for nanolasing, um, or you could go towards different applications in material science or in biochemistry. So, you know, the idea of having few tamed X-ray photons, this could have a, a number of applications, a number of fields, also beyond physics in general. And um, definitely this is not easy. And one of the problems is, well, okay, first of all, atoms do not have resonant transitions for this. This is why we need nuclei. We also have the problem that often the light that we can get in is not completely temporally coherent. So it's not perfectly coherent. So X-ray lasers are not as cool as optical lasers. And also a lot of cool things in the optical regime have been done with cavities, right? So kind of you put two mirrors and you bounce light back and forth. And this doesn't work so well with X-rays because we do not have so-called high finesse X-ray cavities that we have uh, with infrared or optical photons. For instance, is very, very good, very well-known cavities, which also got the Nobel Prize, right? From the Serge Halors group in, in Paris. So this is challenging, definitely. What I will tell you today will be, uh, what is our approach in the field, rather new field of X-ray quantum optics, um, how we can use atomic nuclei for that, and uh, what are the tricks we can use. And I'll just give you a little bit of a glimpse of what can be done and what we could achieve so far. So instead of using atomic transitions as resonant transitions that can kind of you know, absorb light and re-emit it, um, we will use nuclear transitions. So this means, for instance, that often we use uh, iron-57, so we use Merzbauer nuclei, so nuclei which can absorb and re-emit light recoilously. Um, and iron-57 is the most well-known Merzbauer nucleus. And it has um, um, the, basically the energy difference between the nuclear ground state and the first excited state is 14.4 kilovolt. This is an equivalent of 0.86 angstrom wavelength, right? So we are talking about hard X-rays. Now, um, what do we do with these nuclei? So how do we have them meet light, right? And interact with X-ray light? Well, this is very specific. So uh, we are using so-called film film cavities um, for X-rays. These are very bad cavities if you think in terms of cavities, but let me explain what they are. They are basically a a very, very thin sandwich, a sandwich of very thin layers. This entire stack will be maybe 100 nanometers or less. And we are having as the first layer, a high Z material, for instance, platinum or palladium. Um, and this is something which can allow a pulse of X-rays which comes in grazing incidence, so almost parallel to the surface, to couple evanescently. So somehow the light couples and enters here below the surface and creates a kind of standing wave. The standing wave is, I, I tried to put it here in, in a color coding. So this uh, on the right-hand side is actually a plot of light intensity uh, in color coding. The white stripes show you where these layers are. So basically this middle will be the position of the green layer over here. And at a certain incidence angle, still very small, right? So almost all grazing incidence means all, almost parallel to the surface. Um, you can have basically this blob forming. This is a standing wave of light, of X-ray light forming inside. This is the so-called evanescent field. Now, the layer that we are interested in is actually the green layer. This is where we place the nuclei, which are resonant or almost resonant to the frequency of this pulse. And it's actually the other way around. Since nuclei have fixed transition energies, we are tuning the X-ray pulse energy. So no, not the X-ray pulse energy, the energy of the photons and the X-ray pulse, right? To match this 14.4 kV. And these other layers that you see, they are just buffers. So the middle layers are always high, uh, low Z material like carbon, for instance, which does not interact with X-rays at all. The only thing it does, it allows you to place the layer of interest, which is the green layer, exactly where you want it within the standing wave, right? You could have at different angles, two blobs, and you want to position 
exactly what you want, the layer of, of, of iron nuclei. And this you can do with this low Z material. So high Z material, low Z material, um, iron, or the nuclei of interest for you, right? These are the cavities. And now the thing itself, I just put you a picture uh, that we took of the setup at Petra 3 at the synchrotron. So basically the, the X-rays come here in this, um, through this tube um, to this pipe. And the, the sample itself is placed in the vertical plane. And basically all these layers that I talked about are the shiny part, the shiny polish on the top of this small square. That's it. And under it, there is a silicon vapor, right? So basically everything that you can really see and touch is uh, the silicon vapor. Of course, you don't touch it because you cannot touch the surface. The surface needs to be incredibly uh, clean now. Okay, now um, these are the cavities. So they rely on this evanescent field. And what is special about these cavities is they allow us to use collective effects because you do not scatter on just one nucleus, you scatter on many, and they are all identical. And this is what we call collective effects, so cooperative effects, right? More, an ensemble of several identical nuclei behaves differently than just a single one. And this is something that brings means of control. Maybe this is strange for you. I thought that one can go a little bit in more details what I mean by these collective effects. How could, do they come about? Why are they important? Um, so I just have here a very short tutorial basically about how does this collectivity, so to say, come about. Um, and then we'll come back to see what does this mean for our cavities. So if you've ever met this topic in some of your lectures, you will probably know that spontaneous decay um, actually cannot be described if you're considering your electromagnetic field as being classical. Spontaneous decay really has to do with the fact that you, you use a quantized field description, which introduces the vacuum and then the idea of infinite empty modes, right? So what you see here is basically my picture of an atom with several, layer, several levels, and we have the atom in an excited state, right? And if we consider that there are only, there's only classical field around, then that excited state will live forever. Now, what we typically do in quantum optics is the first thing to say, ah, too many levels, it's too complicated. Let's cut just cut the crap and keep just the level which are important. So let's consider this as a two level system. Of course, it's never true, but it's often used as an approximation. Okay, and then this guy is actually interacting with an infinity of empty modes, right? So uh, around us at all times, if you do not live in a cavity, you have all possible field modes, right? So, and they are empty. So there is no photon in it, but they could be photons of all frequencies going in all directions with all polarizations, right? And that's the, the, the vacuum. And the interaction of this excited state with the vacuum modes. So with all those field modes quantized, which are however empty, will explain spontaneous decay and that guy will decay basically which is also what we see in experiments, right? And one can put together equations and you will see that the decay rate is proportional to the uh, dipole moment and the density of modes. And now the question is actually, okay, yes, this is kind of understandable, but what happens now if I do not have just one of these two level systems, one simple atom, but I have many and they all close together and they all interact with the same vacuum. Does this make a difference? And this is actually the question that we need to answer. And uh, the answer that has been given in the literature many, many years back comes from Robert Dickey. Robert Dickey in theory explained that if all these atoms are close together and they all are such that the interatomic distance is smaller than the wavelength of the field, then and by the wavelength of the field, I mean the field of frequency which corresponds to the two levels, to the transition between the two levels, right? Then actually in theory, one can show 
that the decay rate of this ensemble of identical indistinguishable atoms to level systems will go with an exponential which has a factor n inside the exponential. So it will decay much faster. And that's really kind of surprising, right? He called this uh, super radiance. And uh, this is really the quote from the paper set for want of a better term, a gas which is radiating strongly because of coherence will be called super radiant. And this is how he coined the term. So since then, all this is called super radiance. And the super radiant decay is increased by this factor n number of atoms in the exponential, which is really huge. It took about 20 years until this trend was first uh, seen in experiments. And for our understanding today, maybe let's take just a very simple uh, system. Let's say we are taking just two, two level atoms, identical and non-interacting, right? So this doesn't have to do with the interaction between them. This has to do with them interacting with the same field, but not among each other. So let's take just two atoms. They have just two levels, I told you. We keep things simple. And so ground state and excited state. And then let's see what possibilities we have, right? Well, we can have them both in the excited state. We can have them both in the ground state. And now we have two possibilities of ex one excited, one in the ground state. And this actually we often change in a basis of symmetric and anti-symmetric state, right? So we can have the symmetric state and the anti-symmetric state. They both have the same energy. And here comes the trick. And the trick is basically the explanation for the whole story is that um, if I'm looking now how the twice excited state decays, I need to write the total dipole moment operator, which is the sum of the two dipole moment operators of atom one and atom two. And this guy is invariant to transpositions of atoms because they are, you know, identical. It's a little bit like discussing about, uh, you know, fermions and then wave functions of many electron atoms. You know, if the two atoms are identical, I should obtain no change if I switch one to two and two to one. And out of this condition, it turns out that the upper state with two excited atoms cannot go by the anti-symmetric state down. So it can only decay to the symmetric state. The symmetric state decays to the ground state where everybody's in the ground state. And on top, the decay rates are twice decay rates of a single of a single atom. And this is where basically you get it. You have two gamma instead of for two atoms, you have two gamma. And then for three atoms, you have three gamma and so on. So basically it all comes from this condition that you are invariant to transposition of identical atoms because they are identical. All right, that should be simple. Now, this story was about excitation of the entire system, right? So I have two particles and they're both two systems and they're both in the excited state. But in principle, something similar appears also if, for instance, you have a, I have here an example of five now. You have five atoms, you send in one photon. This is in principle resonant to any of these five transitions. And then you detect the one photon coming out after it had scattered, excited and you know, was absorbed and re-emitted. And in principle, the scattering event could have happened in any of these five locations. And in principle, you shouldn't care because the atoms are indistinguishable. And at the end, you know, initial state and final state is all the same. So it's, it's a basically an interference between the five possibilities, which atom has scattered the photon. All of these states, where by red now I, did, I depict the excited state, right? All of them will decay to the same ground state. So basically the intermediate state here is the so-called Dicke state. It is a sum of all possibilities, right? Uh, in which just one single atom is in the excited state and everybody else is in the ground state. This is normalized. And then at the end of the day, you have a very nice Dicke state, which decays n times faster than a single atom. However, this will only happen if the atoms are very close together. Why? Because the atoms should see the field, the incoming field at the same phase. 
And this can only happen if they are all close together and the interatomic distance here, D, right, between each of them is much smaller than the wavelength of this photon coming in and going out. Otherwise, this would not work. Why? Because if, you know, they are stretched out, then each of the atoms, when it absorbs and re-emits, will have a different phase. So if we do not have the condition of a small, you know, small interatomic distance, then we have to put inside our state here an additional phase, right? This will be for an extended sample. And uh, this makes things far more complicated, definitely. At the end of the day, it turns out that if you have such an extended sample, it can still happen that you have superradiance, but only if you were able in the very first place to excite the radiative eigenmode, which is basically now example that we had before the symmetric state, right? The symmetric state is the one which decays strongly. If we somehow by mistake have also excited the anti-symmetric state, that will not decay quickly. And at the end of the day, it's so that if you are able to excite the so-called radiative eigenmode, then this radiative eigenmode will decay faster. So it will have in its decay, if you put here an equation, a part of the decay rate for a single atom, you'll have an additional decay rate and you will also have a small shift. And this shift is called collective lamp shift. It's basically a, a version of lamp shift, if you want, for a system of identical um, scatterers, right? Lamp shift would be, uh, you know, in, in uh, atomic physics, lamp shift is the difference between the 2s and the 2p energy for the orbitals in, in atoms, which are induced by QED corrections. And this is if you want the QED correction, which appears from the fact that it's not just one atom there, but there are several and they're all identical. And the scattering process could have happened through any of them, and you do not know which one, right? So this is the collective lamp shift, which is coming always together with the superradiant decay rate. So uh, why am I telling you all this story? I'm telling you all this story because this is a process which happens in thin film X-ray cavities very nicely. Namely, you have a superradiant decay on top of the spontaneous decay, and you do see a collective lap shift. So a shift of the frequency of the transition, basically a little bit, no, off of where it should have been. Um, and in order to illustrate this, I'm showing you now some experimental data taken in 2010, so which is now by now more than 10 years ago. Yeah? So what you see here is in, on your left-hand side, you see a small shift to from where zero should have been, so to say. It's the energy detuning plotted, which is kind of what you measure minus what where you think the, um, the transition frequency should be. So you see that actually this absorption peak basically is shifted a little bit. And this is a collective lamp shift. It's one of the nicest um, experiments determining a collective lamp shift uh, that exists in the literature because it's a very clean system. Now, the, for me, and for practical reasons, more important part is on the, on the right-hand side. So what you see here is um, the scattered intensity as a function of the time after the excitation, right? So I have a pulse coming in, and this pulse excites my sample. Basically, it, it creates the standing wave inside the thin film cavity, and this excites my nuclear, my, my nuclei inside. And later on at the detector, I'm checking what happened. So when do the photons which have been going via nuclei and be, have been rescattered, when are they arriving here? Now, the experiment was done at a synchrotron source where, where for each X-ray pulse, there was a single photon actually resonant to the nuclear transition. So it means that on each pulse, basically this cavity has kept a single photon. And that photon went here through the iron nuclei and then reached the detector much later. And you do this just many, many times because of the synchrotron, the repetition rate for the pulses is megahertz. And then after maybe one hour, you obtain the spectrum. And you see it's a log scale. Now, the spontaneous decay of iron, as we know it from the charts, which is always just for a single nucleus, um, the lifetime is 141 nanoseconds. And this corresponds to a straight line, right? An exponential decay is here, a straight line. And this would be here, over here, the top red dotted line. 
what they have seen for this sample were other two straight lines, but going much steeper down. This one is the first one had a factor 42 in the exponential and the other one had a factor 61 in the exponential. So actually you really see exponential decay, you see um, this kind of N appearing in the exponent. It's not necessarily the number of nuclei there because it turns out that this N is never that because there are some limitations, uh, but you definitely see it for uh, quite some time, a straight, much steeper decay. And this is a super radiant decay. Now, the super radiant decay is very cool. Why? Because you can control it. Because it turns out that, for instance, by switching on and off the magnetic field, you can completely suppress that part, right? And this gives you control over the system, right? If you can switch on and switch off the strongest of the decays, then you have control. Whereas for the spontaneous decay, you typically do not have control, right? So that's something which happens and it's God given and that's it. But that's not the, the strongest and the most important parameter in the system. The most important parameter is this, the super radiant decay. And this gives us, you know, this collective effect gives us the control of on the system. And now let me show you an example, which is maybe a bit more complicated because it's a more complicated structure, but it's something interesting, which could be um, kind of um, put under the label of uh, X-ray ping pong. So we will interpret now a, an exchange of an X-ray photon as an exchange of uh, a ping pong ball between two um, rackets. And this can happen many, many times before the ball is lost, right? Because whenever you play such a game with, with balls, whether it's tennis or it's ping pong, right? You want to have this exchange long enough um, and that you don't lose the ball too early. So many successful exchanges until the ball is lost. This would be what we call uh, mimicking strong coupling with X-rays. Now, let me explain what am I talking about? I'm talking now about a cavity which doesn't have just one iron layer as we discussed before, but it's an example where I have two iron layers. Um, and the field, which is the X-ray field, which comes here and couples, if unassembly to this cavity, uh, will basically create a coupling between these two layers. So in this picture, the two ping pong rackets are whether the excitation of this one single photon that comes from the pulse and is resonant, whether it is in layer one or layer two. Of course, each of these layers can lose the photon. And this is depicted by the gamma one and gamma two rays here. And the photon itself is our ball. And what I will show you is, we predicted from theory and experiment has shown it, is that you are able to control the system such that the photon is exchanged many, many, many times between these two layers. And you see this in some oscillations which appear at the detector. But what you need for that, basically, you need that this interlayer coupling, which appears because of the field, is stronger than this gamma one and gamma two decays, right? Because otherwise, uh, we cannot do the exchange many times because one of the layers will lose the ball. Huh? our analogy with the ping pong. So uh, if you want in quantum optics, you can put this in a, the picture of a three level system. You have um, the ground state when there is no excitation and the photon is at the detector left already, or you have an excitation in layer one, or you have an excitation in layer two. Each of these excitations can be lost towards ground state. And there is this interlayer coupling, which is the arrow, the blue arrow uh, denoted with omega. And now all these three quantities, the omega, gamma one and gamma two, they're actually controlled by what is the angle with which you come here, um, almost parallel, so very small angle, almost parallel to the surface. And now you see here also some values. So what do I mean a small angle? We are talking about 0.1 degree. This is the incident angle. And this is, these are the three rates, the green one, the blue one and the red one. And what you see is that there is indeed a specific incidence angle for which the blue curve is much higher than the green one and the red one. Meaning that there, if you come at that particular angle, you will force the X-ray photon to go back and forth here many, many times via this coupling instead of being lost somewhere. So this is our X-ray ping pong. 
and um, it could be also confirmed experimentally. So what you basically see in experiment is, if you're looking at the detector, which remember is here, right? Uh, if you're looking at the detector in the time domain, you will see some oscillation. And this oscillation is basically the signature of the fact that that photon has been bumped back and forth between the two layers many, many times. And this is the oscillation that they could see. If you're looking now in the energy domain, what does this oscillation mean? Well, it means that the single iron line, the absorption line that you would have, is split into two. And this two is also observed here. This two actually has to do with the fact that, again, you are basically going back and forth with that photon between the two layers, and you're not observing it properly at just one frequency. So this is what is basically called Rabi oscillations on this side, and this is called vacuum splitting. These are terms that are typically used in Kevin AQED. So this could be observed now with X-rays for the first time. And we were very happy that our kind of um, new field uh, was then featured on the cover of Nature Photonics with quantum, X -rays, quantum optics for X-rays, which is really a, uh, a nice, it was a nice uh, advertisement, right, for the field for us. And this and similar techniques could be the starting point for photonic devices for extra quantum control. See, simply looking for tricks where you are able to control those extra photons and keep them where you want them to be, change their energy, change their temporal behavior. Okay, this was kind of a long, long story about taming X-rays uh, with an example. I will now switch to the second topic, which is um, the nuclear clock. And um, as I realized now that I was rather long and detailed with the X-rays, now it's more, I will start on a more uh, anecdotal note on uh, the uh, thorium and its, its discovery as a new mineral um, to slowly introduce you towards the idea of, of nuclear clocks. So thorium um, has its name because it has been discovered in Scandinavia quite a long time ago. So uh, the thorium uh, ore is a kind of, it's a black mineral and it had been discovered on the Lövo Island close to Oslo in Norway, in Norway uh, by um, Mr. Esmark, whose father was a very famous mineralogy professor at the University of, of Oslo. And the guy himself was a hobby mineralogist so he uh, immediately realized that this must be something new and sent it to his father. His father also had the same opinion that it must be something new and unknown. So he sent it to a famous Swedish uh, chemist called Berzelius. And indeed, one year later, Berzelius announced the new element, thorium. Now, uh, maybe you're not aware, but Berzelius was very uh, productive in finding new elements. So by that time, he already had cerium and selenium. So probably he had run out of uh, inspiration, what else to call the guy, call these new elements. So he decided uh, on Thor, which is a Norse god. It's the son of Odin. It commands thunder and lightning. And you'll see actually the idea I think was not very bad. And I think all of us know him um, since 2011 under the uh, appearance of Chris Hemsworth from uh, Marvel's Avengers. Now, um, actually, this thorium is an interesting element. It has atomic number 90, and it, be it belongs to the actinids. And all actinids are actually radioactive. I mean, if you see here, it is a, a German periodic table, I apologize. You'll see here that there is a dotted line under the element, and this actually means that it is not stable, right? So thorium is not stable, it is radioactive. Of course, Berzelius had absolutely no idea at that time because radioactivity was discovered far later by Becquerel and by Madame Curie. But uh, it was not that bad to call it, uh, right, Thor and uh, mention the lightning because indeed it did have something, it's not stable. But actually what we will talk about today does not refer to its radioactivity on the ground state. What is very special about thorium and what is really unique is that it has a first excited state of the nucleus, which is almost degenerate with a ground state. The difference is just eight electron volt. 
Now, for you guys who might have worked with optical lasers and they're kind of used to one electron volt is right the equivalent of 800 nanometers, uh, this might not seem very small, but typically nuclear transitions are rather in the kilovolt, hundreds of kilovolt or mega electron volt region, right? So if you're looking at all, you know, start with hydrogen, hydrogen, with hydrogen helium, all first excited states are at MeV. So for thorium to find, to have something which is just eight electron volt, which is vacuum ultraviolet, this is very, very special. It is unique. We don't know about anything else. It's thorium 229, because out of thorium as the chemical element, we're interested in a specific isotope, the 229 isotope. This is very, very special. Okay. And this is actually what I would like to use to build a clock. Now, clocks are used to measure time. And what they need is, in principle, a periodical event, like an oscillation, and the way to count it, right? This is what we need. And I think about a pendulum, that's the simplest thing. Uh, if you are thinking about solar clocks, right, then the oscillation is basically the sun. Now, I will not start from the beginning of history. I will start with 1927. Uh, with the first quartz clock. Now quartz crystals are piezoelectric and they have a very even and nice oscillation, which allowed very good precision for that time. It was a precision of 10 to negative seven. So losing one second in approximately 115 days. Now, any of you guys would be satisfied with such a clock as his wristwatch? One second in 115 days? Now, I know it's a rhetorical question. We are online, so you will not reply to me. Uh, but I would settle for that, right? So for a clock, it's absolutely fine, right? For a wristwatch, it's not so bad. And if you're thinking about it, actually, we humans are not particularly quick, right? So uh, Usain Bolt is managing 100 meters in 9.58 seconds. So uh, we should be definitely happy with one second in 115 days. Um, on the other hand, Usain Bolt is not the quickest human on earth. Uh, calculations show that actually Santa Claus has to be because in order to deliver all the presents to all the kids worldwide, he would need to do 100 meters in 0.001 seconds. So he's quicker. But actually on a second thought, it turns out that it's not, it's not necessarily our speed as you know, our mass speed that is so important. It's rather important how quick can we send signals. And this actually improved quite tremendously, right? Because uh, ever since uh, the telegraph started, uh, shit started to happen, right? Because you were getting messages from places which had different times. And um, at the end of the day, actually, it's not it's not our own speed, but it's the speed of the signals that we can we can send, which is important. Nowadays, we're typically sending signals with the speed of light, and there, ten to negative seven of a quartz clock is not sufficient. So, for your wristwatch, yes. Nevertheless, there are other applications which we definitely need more than losing one second in approximately 115 days. Basically, I mean, we need less, right? We need to lose less. And this is why we use atomic clocks, right? Atomic clocks are used since 1967 to give us the official time and their precision is 10 to negative 15, which is one second in 20 million years. And this is what you need for your GPS, right? Any of you guys using a GPS today? Um, distance is velocity times time. And this is basically what we need. We need that the speed of light multiplied by a very well measured time will give us distance. This is why we need the second defined with an atomic transition, right? The second is defined as a duration of uh, 9,192,631,770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfine levels of the ground state of cesium 133 atom. So basically what we have, we have this uh, cesium-133, which has a number of electrons, 55. And the last one is a 6s electron. 
And the 6S electron is actually sitting on a doublet because um, you see that we have an uneven number of nucleons in the nucleus. So we're gonna have a nuclear spin. And the nuclear spin is seven half plus. And this nuclear spin is then coupling the spin of the electron and generating the so-called hyperfine splitting. So here there's basically, if you're looking attentively, of course, this is a very simple and not correct picture of the, of the levels. But if you're looking at this last electron, uh, you will see that it has the possibility to go to uh, an upper state within the hyperfine splitting. And that transition has the frequency of this silly number of 9 billion, 192 million, and so on and so forth per second. That is the frequency of that transition. Its wavelength comes into the microwave regime and is 3.26 centimeters. Now, the uh, idea is therefore that you are irradiating the atoms with microwave radiation. You are checking at which wavelength this radiation is absorbed and the corresponding frequency gives you the time, namely 9 billion times right per second. Um, this is the cesium clock. And the cesium clock is actually giving the official time, for instance, in Germany. Um, for instance, the picture that you see here, it's CS2. It's located at the Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt in Braunschweig. And it's basically uh, giving us the official time. And each country has its own clocks. And these clocks are always, you always have many, right? You don't have just one. Because see, if you have just one clock, you'll never know when it goes wrong unless you know there is a power breach and you know you really see that it doesn't operate. But as long as it gives you the time, you'll never know whether that's correct or not. It only works with comparisons. This is why, of course, in Braunschweig, it's not just CS2. There are many clocks giving the time and you keep comparing, comparing between them. So what we basically are talking about now is replacing the cesium atomic transition with a nuclear transition in thorium. And now let's see actually what would this bring us. So if we're using this eight electron volt excited state of thorium, by the way, this is an isomer, right? Because it's long lived, right? Remember the original definition, uh, this level is long lived. So it has also a very narrow width. And by using this eight electron volt transition, so going not in cesium with a six S electron between the two hyperfine split levels, but going in the thorium, two to nine nucleus from the ground state to the first excited state. Uh, this promise is better precision than the present record. Now you will love but the present record is not given by the season clocks. The present record is given by strontium 87 clock. Uh, and the, the relative accuracy is 2.5 times 10 to the negative 19. Yeah, that's the relative precision of that clock. So in principle, the second as defined right now it's not the most precise definition that you could have, but at the SI unit is still defined with the cesium clock and with the cesium transition. And now we have thorium, which uh, calculations say at the moment that one could reach 10 to negative 19, so you would gain a factor of 2.5. Um, this would be useful for a number of applications regarding GPS. This would be very useful for an independent secondary standard, frequency standard, because again, remember that you always need several clocks and it's always good if they are very different in the operation because then you can keep, you know, they can keep uh, each other in check. And what's also very interesting and it's very, very unique also for thorium is that um, one could ask all kinds of silly questions that you shouldn't ask, right? For instance, are the fundamental constants constant in time? Because see, we keep things, to, we think things are constant, right? The, the, five, uh, the uh, fine structure constant or lambda QCD, we believe they are constant because we've never seen them change. But maybe we haven't seen them change because they're changing so little that uh, we cannot notice that. On the other hand, as for the age of the universe, maybe it matters. So you could ask such questions to clock especially to a nuclear clock, you could ask questions that you maybe cannot ask only from an atomic clock because an atomic clock does not have a nuclear component, right? It doesn't do all the strong force. Um, you could use such a clock to search for dark matter. You could use such a clock to check whether the Einstein's equivalence principle is correct. 
um, and so on and so forth. So again, it would help you to ask a number of silly questions that maybe you shouldn't ask, but could be very relevant. And to show you how unique this is, I have put here a plot of um, nuclear transitions and few atomic transitions. And what you see here is basically it's energy on one side and it's half-life of the transition itself on the other side. And the first thing that you see is what I told you at the beginning, that eight electron volt is absolutely unique for uh, nucleus is because all these guys are high up, right? So see the energies of the transition start at KeV, just with two exceptions. One of them is uranium 235. I can tell you the energy that's 76 electron volts and uh, thorium, which has this eight electron volt. And what you see, how, how far it goes in, you know, on the horizontal has to do with what's the lifetime, right? You would like to have a long lifetime, but not very long because then you cannot drive it at all. This is the case of uranium 235. And thorium is the one which stays here close to all the red dots. And the red dots are the atomic shell transitions used for clocks, for atomic clocks. That's basically the only nuclear transition which enters there. Now, what do we need to do to build such a clock? Well, there are two aspects. One of them is that we need the precise energy of the nuclear transition. Because when I give you eight electron volt, um, I should basically tell you that, you know, uh, 15 years ago, we thought it was three. <laughs> so uh, it's a very, because it's such a special nuclear transition, it's very tedious to measure very, very tedious to measure, right? It would be much easier to measure properties of one of the dots over here, the upper dots. And it's very difficult to measure precise properties of this nuclear transition down here. And the other thing we need to do is, as soon as we know more or less, what is the frequency? So what is the, the transition energy and the corresponding frequency? We will need to um, try to build a VUV narrowband laser, which drives the transition so that we can operate the clock in a very similar manner to how atomic clocks are operated, right? You know, try to drive the transition, see at which frequency it has been absorbed, that frequency measures the time. I will just now go into one example about precise energy determination. Uh, one of the more recent results, which was uh, very nice. And that is also showing us one of the problems for such a low-lying nuclear transition. Namely, it's not sufficient to understand how the nucleus couples to light. One needs to understand how the nucleus couples to the atomic shell because it's such a small energy, actually. The couplings between the nucleus and the atomic shell are very, very strong. To give you an example, right? If I have thorium and it's an excited state, Right, and this is kind of the nucleus part here, right? So if I have thorium in the excited state, so far in all my quantum optics story and what I've shown you, for instance, for iron, we assume that the thing decays by emitting a photon. But this is not what happens in a thorium atom, unfortunately, or fortunately, I cannot say right now. What happens in a thorium atom, neutral thorium atom, the, is the isotope inside is 229, the nucleus is excited that eight electron volts will be transferred to the electrons, electronic shell, namely to the outermost electron, which is, happens in this case, a 7S electron. And that 7S electron will be kicked out. So it leaves the atom, ionization takes place. This, is, this process is called internal conversion. It's nine orders of magnitude more often happening than just emitting a photon. So see, actually, we are in a completely different regime here. And this we need to understand. So we need to understand very well the coupling between light, the nuclear transition, and the atomic trans uh, the electronic electrons which are around. Now it happens here with thorium that only the outermost electron can leave with eight electron volt because the first ionization potential is at 6.3, right? So uh, in case you remove the first electrons or the outermost electrons, then the nucleus cannot decay anymore by internal conversion. It needs to decay by emitting a photon, and this takes ages. This is why actually radiative decay was never observed so far. I put the question mark because there are some preliminary results from a group in Belgium, which claim to have seen something in the VOV, which could have come from the nucleus, but the results are not yet submitted. So this is why as of today, I cannot guarantee in a few months, but as of today, one has never seen a photon being emitted by that excited state. 
but internal conversion, one has seen plenty. Uh, it has been first just observed without measuring the, the energy of this electron. And now in principle, if we are able to measure the energy of the electron very, very precisely, then we would be able to infer what is the energy of the nuclear transition. And the experimental results that I'll show you right away are coming from the LMU in Munich. Nevertheless, the experimental setup is in Garching, right? Where part of the physics of the LMU is located. So you are exactly at the spot where things happened, more or less. So the guys were trying now to observe such an event and measure very, very precisely those electrons. And uh, just in a nutshell, what happened? So first of all, I need to get you know that excited nucleus. And that's also not very easy because so far nobody managed to, you know, just to put in light at the right frequency and excite the nucleus. And this also has to do with the fact that we don't have the laser and we don't have the laser because we don't have the nuclear transition energy pretty precise. And in this uh, region of frequencies, depending exactly on where the frequency is, what wavelength you need, you'll have different building principles for the laser. So that's really very important that you know exactly where it is so that you're not trying with principle A and then it turns out, you no, know, the thing is over there so it's not gonna work, right, at all. So see, it's kind of a, a vicious price, <laughs> a circle, because you start, you know, you don't have the energy, then you cannot build a laser, then you cannot have the energy, then you cannot build a laser, and so on. So it's kind of stupid. But there are also other ways to excite the isomer, namely a uranium-233 source decays alpha. And it turns out that 2% will end up in the isomeric state, and 98% will end up in the ground state of thorium. So we have the possibility from such a source to create a beam of thorium ions, most of them in the ground state and very few of them in the isomeric state. Okay, and I need them to be ions so that I can guide them. And if they are ions, then internal conversion doesn't happen. We just discussed about this. Okay, now we basically remove these guys and we need a mass spectrometer because we need to filter out other reaction products, right? This is radioactive decay. Um, you might have also uranium coming out. So you just need the thoriums of two to nine sort. And you don't know yet whether they're in the ground state or the excited state. And you have them in a state such that they do not decay for a long time because the internal conversion is blocked. But now you want to see internal conversion. Therefore, you need to put back the electrons in the thorium to make it neutral because only the presence of that very last electron when it's neutral, will allow the process to happen that you want to measure. So this is why here, now we zoom in on this side. This is the zoom part. And we basically send here the beam through a very thin graphene sheet. And this very thin graphene sheet would neutralize again the thorium. So the electrons will go back. <coughs> and then those ones which are in the excited nuclear state, can kick out the outermost electron. So if such thing happens, then here there is a region with a magnet which, which gets that electron. This electron then goes into a magnetic bottle type retarding field spectrometer, meaning that it's here basically decelerated. And we see whether we measure it here. Now, depending on the voltage that you have, right, as a function of voltage, you will see at which exact voltage the energy, the electrons do not reach anymore the detector, meaning they don't have a sufficient energy. So out of that, you can basically infer what was the energy of the electrons being emitted here. And this in the picture that we had so before means that I could tell you what is the nuclear transition frequency, right? The transition energy, because that is shared on the ionization potential and the kinetic energy for the electron. So the story is very nice. Nevertheless, the spectrum that they measured was nothing what they expected because they expect here a clear cut. You know, there is some retarding voltage out of which nothing comes out. And the plot was also clear. You know, the things was, uh, <laughs> the curve was kind of just smoothly coming down. And it turns out that the reason is in the neutralization procedure here, we were not always in the electronic ground state. So all electrons were in place, yes, but they could have been due to the collision, basically, you know, just passing by some excitation of the electronic state. So we would have not the ground state of the electrons decaying to several channels of 
excited pro possible electronic states in thorium plus, meaning that basically the energy conservation relation you need to write needs to, needs to take into account what was the initial state, initial excitation for the thorium neutral atom, and what were the possible final states for the thorium plus after the electron has left. And this was actually not easy, and this is where my group was involved. So we basically had to calculate internal conversion rates for all these possibilities, and then out of that help extract out of this measured energy spectrum, the value of the energy, which um, turned out to be around 8.3 electron volt. So uh, now we have a more precise value of the energy, especially the old value was at uh, 7.6, and then at 7.8 plus minus a half, plus minus a half, electron volts so now have a different position of the energy and a much narrower error bar. And this was quite a step forward, which uh, made us this very nice piece of art on uh, the nature cover. And it happened that the, the person from my group working on this project who did the calculations has a wife who's a, um, an artist and she did this picture. We're well, very happy that we made it then with all results, so to say, <laughs> on the cover. Okay, now I see I've spoken already for an hour, so that's more than I would have thought. Let me come to my conclusions. Basically what you heard today is that we could have novel tasks for atomic nuclei. We could either use them to control single X-ray photons with the goal to design and establish devices for quantum technologies which use X-rays. Or what you've also heard is that one could use a nuclear transition to have a nice and very precise clock which would be better than what we had so far, and which could ask, could allow us to ask ourselves questions that we couldn't ask so far, right? Um, on this new nuclear frequency standard. So uh, I hope this was uh, something new and interesting for you as well to take home. And with this, I will thank a number of uh, funding agencies, uh, my group in. Uh, various shapes and of course you for your attention.